Hello, and welcome to Stories of Heritage, Asian American Voices in Children's Literature. Throughout May, the Center for Global Education at Asia Society, in partnership with Holiday House Publishing and You and Me Books, featured an own voices reading series that spotlighted the work of Asian American children's book authors. Children's books have developed empathy when children read about and identify with characters dissimilar to themselves. Furthermore, it is equally important for children to see themselves in the books they read. Despite overwhelming research that reading diverse books are vital for fostering confidence and empathy in children, Asian American stories are still underpublished and underrepresented. This discussion will explore the importance of highlighting Asian American voices in children's literature by engaging a panel of best-selling authors and advocates for diversity in children's books. Please welcome Aram Kim, author of Sunday Funday in Koreatown, Hope Lim, author of My Tree, and Andrea Wang, author of Watercress. Our featured moderator for this evening, Rocky Murchandani, will not be able to join us, so I will have the privilege of moderating this discussion. Welcome Aram, Hope, and Andrea. So as, as a start, what I'd like to do is ask each of you if you could tell us a little bit about your book and your inspiration and motivation for writing your story. So let's get started with Aram. Do you want to go ahead and get started? Sure. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Aram Kim. I'm an author and illustrator for children's picture books. I wrote and illustrated Cat on the Bus and the three books that you see behind me, You Me Friends and um, Family Series, including No Kimchi for Me, Let's Go to Taekwondo, and Sunday Fun Day in Koreatown. Um, I was born in Ohio. I'm only mentioning this because I know Andrea grew up there too. <laughs> and I grew up in South Korea. And now I live in New York. Um, and to talk about the inspiration behind my books, I will talk about my most recent one, Sunday Fun Day in Koreatown, because that one specifically started at the very early, like many years ago, and it only just came out last year. And that book was inspired by two of my favorite memories. One is from my childhood and one is from my adulthood. So my childhood memory that inspired Sunday Fun Day in Koreatown is that I used to go out for a really long walk with my dad on Sundays because Sunday was my only, that's my dad's only day off at the time. So we would do a lot of things at the time together. So we'd go out for snacks, we'd go visit grandma, we'd go around the neighborhood. And that's the time that we would talk a lot together too. So that was my very cherished memory from childhood that lasted for a really long time. And the one that from adulthood is actually after I moved to New York City about 15 years ago. When I came to New York City, everything was new and foreign and I was walking around a lot in my neighborhood. And one day I just stumbled upon a Korea town that I didn't even know it existed. And it just amazed me so much at, the at that time. And I was really happy to see a block like filled with Korean stores. And I was really happy. So this book feels really special to me because it was inspired by two of my favorite memories. So I think that is about it for me for now. Hey, wonderful. Um, I hope, would you like to tell us a little bit about your book and what inspired you to write your story? Sure. Um, my name is Hope Plim. I'm the author of My Tree, and I was born and raised in Korea, and now I live in San Francisco. Uh, My Tree is a story about a young boy who, a uh, young boy from, who moves from Korea to America and finds a special connection in an old tree um, that, re, that is reminiscent of his home. And with that friendship and connection, he feels at home in a new land. Um, then um, during rainstorm, the tree falls down and he was really sad and he was longing for the tree grows every day until he finds a new beginning and hope in a new tree that is planted in the same place where the old tree um, used to stand. So my tree is very personal and it is a, a story that was inspired by real life experience. Um, we had this old plum tree in the backyard of our new home. 
And I still remember the first time I saw the tree, it had um, steady and calm presence. And I felt like it was welcoming us into a new house. Uh, then during rainstorm, it fell down. And when that happened, we we're away for family vacation. And when we came back, we found our tree lying across the yard without touching or damaging anything, like any part of properties. And that was quite surprising to us. So I called my mom, who was in Korea, and told her what happened. And she said something very profound. She said, an old tree knows how to lie down when it's time. And what she said was really helpful because it framed our sadness into something positive and also made us think of circle of life. So we planted a new tree uh, so that the legacy of old tree can live on. But then it wasn't until one morning after tree was taken away, I look out the window and was really struck by the emptiness of our yard and how different it looked without the presence of our old tree. So I grabbed a piece of paper and wrote down what I remember about our old tree throughout the four seasons. And that became the first draft. And I work on the story and later added my background as an immigrant. And that's how my tree was born. Beautiful story. Thank you so much for sharing that with us both. Um, and Andrea, why don't you tell us a little bit about your book? Great. Thank you, Neelam. And thank you to the Asia Society for having us. So I'm Andrea Wang. I am an author of picture books and middle grade books. And today I'm going to be talking about Watercress, which came out last year. And um, it is also very similar to Aram and Hope stories in that it's based on a memory and based on um, real life experiences. And in my case, it's kind of a semi-autobiographical story based on this memory I had of picking watercress by the side of the road when I was a kid. And unlike Aram's memories, which were happy and fun, <laughs> I did not really enjoy this experience. Um, and when I first wrote about it, it was like a happy, fun story. And then over time, I was like, this it really wasn't. And I had to go back into my um, feelings as that young child um, to discover the true meaning of this experience for me, which was mostly feeling embarrassed by my family. Um, I'm the daughter of Chinese immigrants and I was born in the Boston area. And I didn't, you know, really understand a lot of what my parents wanted us to do or how they behaved felt very, you know, um, just, I was ashamed of my family um, and, and, and embarrassed by them. Didn't really understand much about my culture and my heritage. And in the book, um, the main character comes to a new understanding and appreciation of her culture when her mother shares a family story. And so that part of the book is a little different from my own um, real experience. You know, my mother did have a sibling who passed away, although the circumstances around that were a little bit different. But um, yeah, so it's very much uh, a personal story and, you know, one that I hope conveys uh, you know, like, you know, a, a, a message of understanding and acceptance of who we are. Thank you for sharing that, Andrea. And I think what's so um, great and inspiring about all of your books is that, you know, exactly what you just said, you know, it's about kind of promoting acceptance and not only for, you know, your friends or people in school, but your own parents, you know, sometimes it's hard, especially when you are a child of immigrants, you're trying, you yourself are trying so hard to assimilate into this new culture and your parents are completely different. They grew up somewhere else, they can't relate and it's, it can be very difficult. So, um, you know, we are so pleased to have had the opportunity to highlight your books because I think a lot of children's books that are sometimes featured in schools don't kind of, um, you know, talk about this angle of growing up and how accepting who you are and who your parents are is also just as important as accepting everyone in your classroom. So um, mm -hmm. thank you all for sharing that. And so, you know, along those lines, um, there are so many themes that run through your stories, including family, courage, friendship, love, hope, gratitude, um, you know, all, so many amazing themes. If you can kind of speak to those, you did a little bit um, in the introduction, but if there's anything in particular that you'd like to add on, 
about, you know, these amazing things that run through your stories. Um, and we can go back to Aram for that one. Yeah, sure. Um, so as Neelam said, I think all those elements are there, especially families and love and courage. Um, but especially, I think the main theme that always runs through all my books is about keeping an open mind. So um, all my books have that theme, like intentionally and in un intentionally, I think it just kind of like goes there because I really think about it in a way. And I also had to be that way when I moved to this new country and then like seeing all these new things. Um, but especially for Sunday Funday in Koreatown that we I am talking about today, like keeping an open mind is a central theme. So the main character, Yumi, so she plans out everything from breakfast to outfit, like what she's going to eat and read and do, but nothing goes as she plans, but she still has fun because there are new things that she can try instead of the other things that she was going to try because she is keeping open mind. But then another thing is that I think she could do that because there were people around her helping her that way. Like there were, there was a dad who's suggesting new snacks. There was a librarian who was recommending a new book. And there were all the other things and people who were helping Yumi to try something new. And Yumi was open to it so she could have fun. And I think this theme about keeping an open mind and accepting new things um, is not only applying for children that the books are for, but it also applies to adults because I feel like as an adult, it's even harder to keep an open mind once we are so set in our ways. So I am hoping that when adults are reading these books with their children, like it would resonate with all of them. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, how about Hope? Um, yeah, um, my tree was originally a story about a young boy and an old tree and their friendship. I did not intend to write about immigrant, but then as I was working on it, I realized that the child's longing for the tree that fell down was similar to my sense of nostalgia I have mm -hmm. as an immigrant, you know, for the things that are gone. So... I changed the main character into an immigrant child who moved from Korea to America. And after the change, I have to figure out why the boy feels connected to an old tree in America. And that made me look back on my early days as an immigrant. Uh, I came to America in my 20s and really struggled with the language barrier. And language barrier was something I didn't quite anticipate. Um, I thought my English was good when I lived in Korea, uh, but that wasn't the case at all. Um, and actually, uh, in fact, the language barrier um, gave me a sense of inadequacy that made me feel out of place in many situations where I just couldn't express myself in a way I wanted. But internally, I had this desire that I wanted to find my place in America and feel comfortable. And I was hopeful that that will happen someday. So I infuse my desire and hope into my tree where the child finds a new connection after going through emotional growth and feels uh, hopeful and optimistic in a new land. So the themes of my trees are loss and longing and seeking connection and new beginning and hope. And they are my themes of, themes of my life as an immigrant. Beautiful, thank you. Um, Antia, what would you like? Both Aram and, and Hope's answers are so beautiful. And I think our stories overlap so much and, and reinforce these themes. Um, as I mentioned before, Watercress also has some themes of shame and embarrassment and feeling othered. And, uh, but ultimately, it is a story about hope, right? Um, similar to to these other books. And I think one thing I'd like to add is that, you know, I grew up in a family where there was not a lot of talking about the past. Um, and it, I understood that it was painful for my parents to talk about the past, but it left me kind of feeling like I didn't really know um, 
where my family had come from or what had happened to them. I just, this sense of disconnection from my parents. And, you know, I really hope that Watercress opens space for families and readers to share these stories about their own personal histories. Um, because I found that very helpful when my parents finally did start sharing their own stories, um, similar to the way the mom does in Watercress. And, um, you know, I, I, yeah, <laughs> I'm just going in circles now, but <laughs> I really just hope that, you know, we have more open communication, um, especially between immigrants and children of immigrants. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much for, for all of your answers. And I agree with Andrea, they are, you know, just beautiful stories and just very unique ways to um, help a young person kind of understand different cultures and, you know, what it is like, like as I mentioned earlier, you know, to be from, you know, as a, a family, a, a, from an immigrant family, uh, excuse me. And so I, I think that's, you know, really just amazing the way we've all kind of been able to um, really help us capture those three themes through your stories. And what I talked about in my setup a little bit was how diverse books, um, you know, really help kids kind of understand different cultures, um, which is amazing, but they also do what you were all talking about, which is equally important, is for children to see themselves in books, which um, until having my own children, I didn't realize how important that was. Um, because when I grew up, I didn't see myself in most books. Um, and I didn't realize how important it was, and it really is. And so I, I want to thank you for that. But a question related to that is, um, it's obvious you're all advocates for diverse books as authors. Um, and I just wanted to know if you can talk a little bit about what role do you think Asian American voices have in helping to build empathy and a global understanding of young people? And um, Aram, maybe we can get started with you. Yeah, definitely. Actually, um, hearing um, Hope and Andrea's talk about the books and the inspiration and how all that came together gave me, like, I think it just gave us such good range um, where I, like, really, it shows us how really diverse within the Asian voices, too. So I really love how all our characters in the books that we are talking about are in different kind of like stages. Um, so for example, like Hope's character, like the boy immigrated, like boy moved from the from Korea to like here, right? And then um, in Andrea's story, the girl was born and raised here, but then has this like communication or conflicts with the parents who grew up in China. So there is this like kind of like a generational gap and the communication that like they are going through. And in my book, it like the Korean culture is such a big part of it. But then there is no word of immigration or there is like no talk about the immigration. Like in my head, they like the Yumi is like Yumi was born and grew, grew up here. And it's just like her culture, like so I think it does like all these different stages that our characters are showing. I think it just like shows so well how different that Asian Americans experiences are. It cannot be just set in one single perspective. And I really like to talk all about these like different characters. It's so, it fascinates me. <laughs> and I hope it does other audiences too. Um, but then to answer Nilam, your question about um, Asian American voices, um, how to contribute to empathy and global understanding in young people, I think it is a little bit of a tough question to answer because I think we know the answer, but it's kind of hard to put in words. Um, so American, like Asian American voices had received very little attention for a long time, I think. And um, they, we always existed, they existed and Asian American creators have always been creating, but it just had like very little attention. And very sadly, I think it's not unrelated to the hate crime towards Asians that increased the past few years because there was so much misunderstanding like very wrongly mystifying or fantasizing Asian American voices and culture. I think that were contributed to that 
horrible like crimes that increased. So by sharing more of Asian American voices in especially everyday culture, like literature, movies, and music, I think that definitely helps um, build empathy and the understanding in young people. Like more we share, more it will build. So it sounds like a <laughs> cliche, but I think that's the, yeah, that was what I was thinking. No, no, it's, it's not at all a cliche. It's, um, it's a very interesting take on it. So thank you for sharing that. Um, Hope, how about you? Yeah, um, I agree with what Adam said. Um, and for my case, I think I believe in the power of storytelling. Um, you know, we all have our own stories to tell. And when we share our stories, we make connection with the people from different backgrounds. And the connections bring us together, uh, hopefully to a place where we see each other as the same human beings. And I think that that's where we wanna go by raising Asian American voices and amplifying uh, our voices and sharing our stories. Um, when I came to America, I learned that Asian Americans have been viewed as foreigners and outsiders, despite the long immigrant history. And coming from Korea, that is a mostly homogeneous society where Koreans are everywhere. I was quite surprised by that perception and stereotypes. And I think that just like Aram said, I think that best way to address that is to tell our stories, continue to tell our stories and raise our visibilities. And in that way, our kids can see themselves in books and stories and media and everywhere in a validating way. And they can also learn about um, experiences, uh, experiences of different people and have a greater understanding of the world where we live in. And I think that that's the direction we wanna go. Um, and in that way, you know, hopefully we can reach a place or create a safe uh, space where differences are embraced and um, that's the word, embraced and celebrated instead of become a source of hatred and discrimination. So I think we have all uh, have, stories, uh, have stories to tell and then we continue to do so to help our kids feel empathy and understanding of the world. Yes, absolutely, thank you. Um, Andrea, any thoughts on that? I 100% agree with everything Aram and Hope said. And I do wanna be careful though that we're not saying uh, or pressuring any Asian American Pacific Islander creators that they have to tell stories about identity or um, their own uh, struggles. You know, we don't owe anybody our pain or trauma, you know, and I think that goes back to what we were saying earlier about writing from all different perspectives and writing, um, you know, the, the stories that resonate with us. And we don't want to fall into that trap of of showing non-Asian readers that there's only this single story because we are not a monolith. Um, and I, I, I do think that we should write all the stories. <laughs> and, you know, the more that we can share different stories and perspectives. We normalize the Asian American experience. We humanize um, ourselves in, in, you know, other people's eyes. And I think that builds awareness and empathy. Thank you. And I, I think I agree with, you know, your last statement there. Um, you don't want to kind of continue to perpetuate the other. Like, mm -hmm. well, this is what, you know, a Chinese girl went through, and this is what a Korean boy went through. You know, you, you, I, I totally understand what you're saying. Mm -hmm. And so I think when we talk about voices, we really mean, um, obviously, the stories that you tell, but obviously, you know, who you are just maybe as an American. Maybe you don't want to talk about who you are as a Korean, and maybe you don't care about Korean food, you know, but who you are and what contributions you make in this society are just as important as you know somebody of any other culture. And so um, I think I thank you uh, so much, Andrea, for bringing that up. Appreciate that. Um, and then you know, just in terms of the the world of children's literature, because I know you guys are all in there now. Um, what challenges and obstacles do you feel need to be tackled? So maybe even if we kind of broaden the conversation a little bit outside of. Asian American, um, being an Asian American author, 
But, you know, what, what are some of the things that you find that are still kind of difficult, um, things that need to be tackled, things that need to be addressed in this world of children's literature? If you have any thoughts on that, please. And Aram, we can start with you. Yeah, I think um, I, I really relate to what Andrea was saying about not pressuring Asian American creators to create like certain stories that readers want to hear about their culture. Um, I, I've been thinking about that a lot recently because I myself feel that I would never I, I don't, I, I cannot predict the future, but for now, I think I will never write and illustrate a story that's not, that doesn't have Korean culture in it because such a huge part of it, me. But when there certainly is a pressure from outside that if I am bringing a story that doesn't have any Korean element in it, like, are they going to say, where is that Korean culture that you've been writing and illustrating about? At the moment, I wouldn't have problem with it because I know that I will continue to write and illustrate about it. But in the future, I don't want that to be a pressure on me. And I do know that my fellow um, creators who are Asian Americans, like who are not wanting to create the stories related to their specific culture. And there are all these stories that we all want to tell. And I think it is actually not a trap, but then it is an obstacle to many creators of color at the moment that even though awareness for need for diverse voices is raising, which is very encouraging, but also at the same time, there is a pressure that they want certain stories from them and us. So I think that's something that we need to constantly think about. Um, yeah, and I, there are other <laughs> problems that we need to tackle, but I think I can start with it. Great, thank you so much. Um, Hope, how about you? Anything um, that you think need to be tackled? in the world, kids' literature? Mm. Well, just relate to what RM said. I think RM is talking about everyday diversity, right? Where we have books that captures like universal child experiences, but in everyday setting, but then features different faces of, you know, made like different from different ethnic groups. I think that's the probably direction I want to go to. Uh, but apart from that, um, I think one of the challenges I see is the competition for our kids' attention. Because as a parent, I watch my kids and their friends use smartphone all the time and every day. And I wonder if they have time to read. And as a, someone who really cares about, you know, power of storytelling, I'm sometimes worried that they might miss out, you know, great stories and literature. Uh, because they're getting constant stimulation and instant gratification from social media and digital devices. And for the same reason, I wonder what kind of content will appeal to our kids who are overexposed to digital technology. And that makes me think about like, what kind of story should I write? But I think that um, the solution I can think of is that just we write the best story we can and hopefully our stories can engage them yeah, in a way we want it. Absolutely, and I agree with you that um, you know, we're, we are in constant competition with devices and any kind of device and social media. Um, but I do think there is something innate in children where they are interested in stories, um, whether they come on YouTube or if they come in a book. So I agree that the challenge really is, you know, how can we put down, have them put down their device and actually look at a book. Um, but I think the three of you, I mean, your books, and, and we'll talk about the illustrators in a moment, um, are just absolutely beautiful. And I, I think that they, it wouldn't be hard for a child to, to take a look at a book like yours. So um, I think that's that, that's hopeful for me. Um, okay, so Andrea, do you want to, do you have a comment on that? Um, sure. So I think there are a number of challenges, but we also need to look at not just putting out more diverse content as creators, but 
the industry itself needs to diversify. I mean, in terms of the gatekeepers, the editors, the art directors, um, the people who work at the publishing houses are still majority white. And so the books and that they tend to acquire still lean very heavily towards, um, you know, books that are told from a white perspective. And, you know, the more that we can work towards breaking down whatever obstacles there are um, so that more BIPOC people can enter the field of publishing, I think will be really helpful, as well as other gatekeepers, such as educators and librarians. Um, the more that we have people of color in those roles, I think will really help um, get diverse books into the hands of readers. Great, thank you. And so we have a couple of questions um, uh, from our audience, but so maybe I'll go to those and we'll pivot back to some of the uh, other things that I'd like to dig into. But one question is, who inspires you? Um, artists, any musicians, chefs, you know, what gives you kind of the inspiration or who um, really do you look up to, I guess, um, that inspires you to do what you do? Um, so let's let's switch up the order a little bit. Maybe Andrea, do you want to go first on that one? Wow, I'm inspired a lot by um, just things, you know, other authors and books that I read. Um, by my family members. I have been developing an interest in the history that I was never taught in school about, you know, the history of Asian Americans. And so I'm, I'm really interested in doing research on that and writing about it. Um, but I think, you know, that I'm just really curious about everything, which is, you know, uh, probably what makes us all authors, right? So we want to find out more about this world that we live in. Um, so I'm, I'm inspired by so many things around me, but I definitely uh, try to read as widely and as broadly as I can. Thank you. Um, Aram, how about you? Ah, oh, that is such a difficult question because I think what Andrea said is right. It is very, I mean, it is, I, I am inspired by everything that I see and read around me. And also at my day job, I am actually working with the illustrators to make uh, picture books. And I am very inspired by all these amazing illustrators that I work with. It's very, very encouraging, inspiring. It's very fascinating to see other people's process from like really rough sketches to this amazingly beautiful art like after six months <laughs> it's really inspiring um but i actually do want to talk about this book that probably got me started in children's books if that's okay <laughs> i think it's a little bit random but um i mean of course i think everyone who became an author and illustrator loved the stories as a child and I did too. I always loved stories. I loved like adventure stories. Um, but I actually happened to have a book here, um, Maurice Sendak's In the Night Kitchen. And that actually, I think, got me really started in children's books after I became an adult because I moved to New York City to study illustration, but I didn't know that I would do the children's book illustration. Um, but then when I went to a bookstore by chance, um, I kind of, I couldn't walk away from children's book section. And I didn't even know that I loved children's books at the time, but I just couldn't walk away because all the books there were just so engaging and fascinating to me. And this book I picked out at the time, um, this is actually the same paperback I bought at the time when I went into the bookstore in 2000. 
2006. I didn't know who Maurice Sandak was. I know he's like a master now, but at the time, I didn't know who he was. I didn't grow up with Maurice Sandak. But this book, In the Night Kitchen, when I opened the book, I was just so amazed. I thought illustrations are great, story is so fun. The design is just so perfect. I thought it just is like combination of everything that I wanted. And it was $7. So I was thinking, wow, I can pay $7 and get this amazing like package of story and art. So that really inspired me. And of course, I didn't know for a long time, even after that, I would do the children's books. But I look back now and I think that was actually the very start that I didn't even realize. So long answer to <laughs> soup. That's the kind of, uh, that's the question. So good answering it. And Hope, any, would you like to? Yeah, um, for me, it's my children. Uh, I have two kids and uh, ever since they were little kids, they said something very funny and interesting and very unique. And I was really fascinated by the way they look at the world and how they play. And most of all, their imagination. Um, I was really inspired by everything they did together. And it was just beyond my imagination. So I used their um, experiences as a children in my stories. Even in my tree, the bow is actually, um, it reflects my sensibility, but it came from my son. Uh, my son was the one who named Plummy, and Plummy was my son's favorite tree. So that's how I added uh, inspiration from my kids. And also, I get inspiration from nature. If I see something really striking images and really beautiful scene, then they stay with me for a long time, almost begging me to tell stories. So I'll say my children and nature. Beautiful. Thank you. And Aram, you touched a little bit about um, illustrators, and you are, of course, the illustrator of your series. And we have um, two wonderful illustrators that we also featured in this series, Jason, Jason Chin and Il Sangha. Um, Jason is the illustrator for Watercress and Il Sangha is the um, illustrator for My Tree. And so for our audience who uh, missed, uh, you know, any of the featured readings over the last month, they are available on our YouTube channel. So please check those out because I think what's so um, interesting about these readings is we followed uh, two of them. One of them, with Ram, you and I had a conversation, but with the other two books, we followed it up with um, the illustrators, kind of giving a little tutorial, a little background. And one thing I remember from Jason was talking about nature and how he kind of really studied corn stalks in his, you know, environment or Vermont. And that is actually what inspired him or really helped him kind of create um, you know, those illustrations. And then what was really interesting for me is how he talked a little bit about, you know, the bamboo stalks and how he, you know, there's one particular page where you kind of see them seamlessly going through where there's the image of you all in Ohio or the characters in Ohio and then the image of parents in China. So for those of you who have not in our audience who have not seen, you know, or looked at those videos, I, I would highly recommend it. Of course, purchase the books. But if you want to get a little bit of background on the illustrators, I think that's fascinating. So all of that to say, there's a question here. Um, so maybe around, you know, we know you're the uh, illustrator there, so maybe we can skip you on this one. But um, Andrea and Hope, how did you meet the illustrators of your book? Um, and if there's a special way that you met, we'd love to hear it. If not, you can, you can show that too. So Andrea, we can start with you. Um, yeah, and for... For viewers out there who may not know, authors and illustrators don't usually meet or collaborate on picture books. And I think this is sort of just a longstanding tradition. But in the case of Watercress, because it was such a personal story for me, and Jason um, was a little hesitant about portraying my family, you know, my, my personal memories that you know, our editor, Neil Porter, thought it would be a good idea if we met. And so after the manuscript was acquired, he set up a, a, a time for us to meet. We were both at the same conference together wow. by chance. And so we met um, 
and shared our family histories of immigration and um, growing up. Uh, he spent some time in the Midwest as well. And over the next couple of years, he would call me and we would sort of talk about details that he was thinking of, or I would send him photographs of myself and my family when they were young. And I dug out photographs of my mom and my grandparents in China for him. And, uh, you know, it was, it was great. We, it was a true collaboration and that's, I think, unusual. Um, but it really speaks to how, um, he was able to convey the emotions so beautifully, you know, that we talked a lot about, um, how my character was feeling and, you know, uh, and the different emotions that she was going through, um, through the story. So, and then I just left him alone because I didn't want to like impose my ideas on him. I really wanted him to have his vision of the book. Um, so I was just completely blown away by, you know, what he produced and yeah, the, the bamboo and the corn and how they merge in the gutter. It's just, it's brilliant. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And I, and I do hear you on that. It's, you know, it's not like you get to choose which illustrator, illustrator you get to work with. So hope maybe you, if you sh could share your story about your collaboration with Il Sunna, maybe you didn't choose to work together, but after you did, you know, what kind of interactions did you have and how did you collaborate? Yeah. Well, I think Andrea has something that I dream of for myself. I'd like to see illustrators someday and then, you know, collaborate together. But that wasn't the case for me at all. Actually, my uh, I follow more conventional path of where uh, illustrator and authors are, you know, just never meet each other. And that was okay for me, actually. And I met Il Sung at one of the webinars and heard about his uh, inspiration and process behind the art and it was I found it really interesting because it was like walking through creative channel of his mind and it was really interesting. Uh, when I received Il Songna's art, I was blown away. You know, I had my own vision as a writer, but I knew that illustrator can bring their own interpretation, visual interpretation, and I was really eager to see his vision for my tree. And not only it was beautiful and striking, there's just so much emotion in each spread. So I was really curious where he got all this inspiration and uh, his own stories behind all the scenes. And I learned later that he had this personal experience of losing trees, you know, and so he actually convey and brought in his personal experience into uh, his illustration. And when I find out, I thought, ah, no wonder, because there's so much emotion and the illustration felt so personal to me. So I was really happy to find out the motivation behind this art. But I really hope to see him someday in person because I have, I have questions about his illustrations. Like there are many personal touches that uh, were not uh, stated in text. Like there's a dog and cardinal. I think that is a symbol of hope and the birdhouse in uh, my tree. And the more I look at it, just the new details I discover, you know, like composition and colors and contrast. And one of the things that really surprised me about his illustration is one particular spread that I call ghost tree. And it was the scene where the child goes out to the backyard after the tree was taken away and he remembers the tree tall, crooked, quiet. And when I wrote that text, I had a similar same image of tree standing like a ghost. It's like almost like channeling the spirit of tree. And Il Sung and I had an exact same vision for that spread. So I felt chills when I look at that spread and I thought, wow, how could he do that? So I talked to him about it and he said, he just wanted to have, because that's such a strong, uh, emotionally powerful scene, he wanted to make a contrast with, uh, using the color black and white. And I, I look at it black and white, it's like a separation between you know, earth and the spiritual world. And then he brought all the elements so well in that scene. So it was quite surprising. And I'm so happy that he illustrated my tree. Yeah, that, that was definitely a very beautiful spread. I remember that. Um, the other one I really like is the one where uh, he showed the four different seasons and what the tree looked like mm -hmm. four seasons. And then the final winter season when you know, the main characters looking out the window, which was, I thought, really, it's a great way to depict what a tree looks like, obviously, throughout the year, but how a child engages with the tree, um, depending on the season. 
you know, so I, I, I thought that was very beautiful too. So definitely wonderful illustrators. And finally, Aram, I want to just kind of go back to a conversation we had um, during your program a few weeks back, and which is, you know, you have your characters are all animals. And, um, you know, how did you come up with that? You know, what is it that you did to kind of, oh, how did you come up with that idea, I guess? That's the question. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, like as we talked about during our program, I drew Yumi and her family cats because I loved drawing cats. <laughs> and I, yeah, like I was saying that I actually wished I had a better answer to it, but that was the main reason that I was, I had the cat and cats are very fun animals to watch. Like they have so much emotion. It's like, I call them like cat TV because it's so fun to watch them. And they can just like do things like very silly things very quietly. And if you're watching them, they're very funny. So I was drawing a lot of cats at the time while I was drawing my first book in the series, No Kimchi for Me. And then when we decided to do a sequel to the book, then that Yumi's world expanded outside of her household. And I thought, oh, this is actually a chance to draw other animals that I liked. So I was drawing other animals too. And in Sunday Fun Day in Koreatown, they go out like even like a bigger world. And then I got to draw more animals. And as I was saying before in the program, like some of the animals were like curated. They are there for a reason. And some of the animals are there because I like drawing them. So, for example, in a supermarket scene in Sunday Fun Day in Koreatown, like Yumi and dad go into the Korean grocery store and a lot of animals there, like the crane and the black bear and actually the dog and the dog baby, like who are buying this like Napa cabbages, they are the animals who live in Korea, like the physically, the geographically, they, the dogs are originated in Korea and the bear and the crane, they live in the region. But then there are other animals like red panda who don't live in Korea, but then they are in a neighborhood country. <laughs> and also they are these animals who are just there because I like drawing them and Korean grocery store is not only for Koreans like anyone comes in to get the ingredients and food so some of the animals are curated and some of the animals are there because I was actually drawing the animals that I liked drawing for example like I drew platypus in a comic room in one of the like Koreatown scene because I think they are just amazing animal <laughs> like very weird but very unique so i just took a chance to draw all the animals that i liked drawing thank you for that no that's that's really great background i mean i didn't realize that there are certain animals that you chose that were actually native to korea and then when you left the neighborhood you had other types of animals that were not native to korea so i think that's really interesting thanks for sharing that um okay so Couple of more questions here. We're, you know, we're doing pretty good on time. Uh, do you have any advice for parents or educators um, about introducing, you know, it could be diverse content, it could be in diverse, not only um, culturally or ethnically, ethnically diverse, but like diversity in topics or genres. Um, you know, a lot of our work at Asia Society, particularly in the Center for Global Education, is supporting parents and teachers in thinking about how to introduce global concepts and global issues into the classroom or into the home. So, you know, if you have any advice for parents on how they can do, continually do this and just, you know, just with an eye out to knowing that summer is coming up and there's summer vacation and any tips for parents on, you know, or educators on what they could do to kind of support this kind of learning um, at school or at home. Uh, Hope, we'll start with you. Mm. Well, I'll start like simply go to library and go to bookstore um, you know, ask them about diverse book and list the books that you're looking for. They are very knowledgeable and they can certainly point you in the right direction. And after that, actually, there's a website uh, called We Need Diverse Books. And that website has like amazing amount of information and resources for diverse books and list of diverse authors. And it's a great place for information for diversity. So if you're looking for diverse content, um, I'll go there first. And it's a really great place. Thank you. Um, how about you, Andrew? 
Yeah, I actually heard this great tip this morning from my friend, Dr. Sarah Park Dahlin, um, who's a scholar of children's literature. And she referenced uh, Cynthia Lydic Smith, who's an indigenous author. Uh, this concept of double shelving. So this would be for like teachers, librarians, booksellers to have, you know, in your library, buy two copies of a book by, you know, a diverse creator. And yes, shelve one in the, you know, AAPI month books, but shelve the other one integrated with all of the other books so that People, parents, children who are looking for specifically AAPI books can go to that shelf and find it, but also people who are browsing biographies or nonfiction or the general topics will also find it there. Um, so I think that, you know, we can do that in all of our um, our home libraries too, right? Just to make sure that we're not bringing out those diverse books only during AAPI Heritage Month or only during Pride Month, you know, but to have them out and available at all times. Right, exactly. It goes to a little bit what we were saying earlier, like normalizing um, this kind of content. It doesn't have to be a special month or a special day to do it, right? Exactly. Um, how about you, Hala? Yeah, I think Hope and Andrea already touched down for all the important parts of how to build a diverse book um, shelves. So I would just add to keep an open mind. It's very abstract, but then I think us like others should keep an open mind to begin with so that we can actually introduce like any diverse books to the readers. Like think of it as reflect, like your bookshelf should reflect the world around you, not the world that you are living in that community, but then world that we are a citizen of global community, right? So like think that we have to reflect that world that we are living in into the bookshelf and into the library that we are building. I think if we think that, like we would actually have a very diverse <laughs> bookshelf. Absolutely right. Just do what it is that you would do as a reader. You know, um, obviously you're not just reading the same thing about the same topic all the time. Uh, one thing that we um, talk to teachers a lot about is, you know, um, developing a library around a theme. So let's say the theme is like around the refugee crisis. And this is a crisis that happens globally. It's not only at one time, you know, right now, of course, you know, we're looking at specific places in the world, but this has historically been um, something that happens in, in, the, in our world. And there are so many books, um, historical fiction, children's books written about this topic. And so if you focus it on a theme, then you are sure to kind of bring in the diversity uh, or bring in um, voices and uh, stories from different parts of the world. And that way kids can really understand the topic or the theme through uh, a variety of different lenses. And so it's, it's something that um, we kind of like to talk to our educators a little bit about is uh, ways in which to kind of build those libraries. So thank you very much for that. Um, and our final question today is if you can share any current projects you're working on, future projects, what, did, what do you want our audience to know about what you're up to and what could, be, what could we all be looking forward to from each of you? So we'll go ahead and start with Andrea this time. Today is actually my book birthday of my latest book, Luli and the Language of Tea, which is also by Holiday House and illustrated by Haewon Yum, who I believe is also an immigrant from Korea. And it is the story of a little girl from China named Luli, and she is in an ESL classroom while her um, parents attend ESL classes next door, but nobody else in the playroom speaks uh, the same language. And so she's decided she's going to bring tea to, um, to share. And she says it in her own language, Mandarin. And because the word for tea is so similar over in over 200 different languages, all the children sort of hear a version of it that they understand, whether it's cha or chai or chai or te. So they all kind of come together. Um, and so I'm, I'm still sort of exploring this theme of how we're all connected to each other and how we have these shared experiences. Um, and I'm also working on some projects that haven't been announced yet, so. <laughs> Well, we'll, look, we'll keep an eye out for those. Thank you, Andrea. Um, Aram, how about you? 
I was a little bit hesitant because I know this um, wonderful panel was hosted by Asian Society and Holiday House, who published all our books. But then the book that I want to talk about was actually by someone else other than Holiday House. <laughs> but I will talk about it because I do feel like the main character here, this is Mina. And this is called the Tomorrow's New Year's Day. I do feel like Mina is a cousin to Yumi, so I will talk about it. It is coming out at the end of the year in December, and it is about Solar, a Korean celebration of Lunar New Year's Day. So I know like a lot of states, Lunar New Year's Day is a statewide holidays. And I was inspired by a lot of Korean families actually who actually go to their schools to explain and like share the culture of Solar Korean Lunar New Year's Day. So this is coming out at the end of the year. Wonderful. Thanks for sharing. And how about you, Hope? Anything on your horizon? Yeah, uh, I have actually a couple of projects that are scheduled to come out. Uh, one is called At the Window. It is a story about child and a neighbor and how their relationship allows a child to discover things that she didn't know previously. And then the other one is called, oh, I can't really name it, but it's a basic story about a friendship and the importance of having trust in people around us. And currently I'm working on a project about mixed emotions. Yeah. Wonderful, thank you so much. And I wanna thank all of you for a very, very inspiring and interesting panel discussion. I had a wonderful time. I hope you did too. Um, I think your books, as you know, mentioned earlier, are just absolutely beautiful um, for the words, for the illustration, and for the stories behind them. And so thank you very much for that and for attending today. And I'd also like to thank Holiday House Publishing for your partnership this month during our um, Stories of Heritage program. And of course, You and Me Books, where these books can be purchased. Um, please continue to follow us at the Own Voices Virtual Reading Room, and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you.